Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hadley Gamble. I am CNBC's senior anchor and international correspondent. Um, it's fantastic to welcome you all here to the World Economic Forum and to welcome this gentleman, His Excellency Ukraine's Foreign Minister, Dmitry Kuleba. Sir, thank you so much for joining us at such a crucial time for your country. It's my pleasure. and Thank you all for coming. I want to kick off by asking you to respond directly from or to the comments made just a couple of days ago by Henry Kissinger. He's essentially said that Ukraine must give up territory in order for Vladimir Putin to save face. I respect Henry Kissinger, but I appreciate that he's not holding any official position in the U.S. administration. Uh, he has his own opinion, but uh, we strongly disagree with it. And this is not something that we're going to do. Yeah. In fact, I believe that this whole line about Ukraine, who has to make a concession to stop the war, failed. From It had failed in, the, in between the 2014 and 2022, because the policy was always, OK, we have to convince Ukraine to be constructive, to engage Russia, to make a concession, to engage Russia, and it never worked. And in the end, it, all, it brought us all to, a, to the biggest war in Europe since Second World War. Uh, if it failed once, it will fail twice. So we, we, I don't, uh, even thinking rationally about this approach, uh, I believe it's flawed and it's not going to work. But a crushing defeat on a proud people does not necessarily ever end well. And I take you back to the First World War. And the response to that, of course, was an economic and social unrest for 10 years in Germany, the rise of fascism and Adolf Hitler and the Second World War. So there seems to be some merit to what he's saying, no? Well, if I remember history correctly, uh, the German army never admitted that they uh, lost the war. They said they were betrayed by, uh, at, at home uh, by the unwillingness of the people and the government to keep, uh, to keep fighting. So, of course, there will always be a difference in the assessment of the situation between civilian, civilians and, uh, and military. Uh, the truth is, uh, I don't know, this war is not a copy-paste of any of the previous wars and will never be. Every war is special. Uh, but what I know for sure is that there is no... It's black and white. There is nothing in between. It's either them or us. And everyone in the world has to make a choice. Where do they stand? In terms of a negotiation, in terms of a peace, the last time that you and I saw each other was in Antalya in Turkey. That was a conversation that you had with your counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, that went nowhere. Where are we today with the possibility of a negotiated peace? Nowhere. It's, uh, you know, Russia <clears throat> is conducting a large-scale offensive in Donbas. And this is the real, you know, you can recall any s movie about World War II, and you can easily imagine what kind of battle is taking place now in Donbas. Tanks, artillery, combat helicopters, air attacks, uh, multiple launch rocket systems, everything is involved. When uh, you are conducting an operation like this, you basically say no to negotiations. If Russia had preferred uh, talks to uh, war, they would have behaved differently. Yeah. Walk us through what you believe you need to win this war. Where is it coming from, and are you getting enough support? I'm talking about from the United States, from Europe, in terms of weapons and money. When you're at war, you literally need everything, everything. And, uh, uh, of course, the key issues now, uh, the situation in terms of supplies is, weapon supplies is much better compared to where uh, we were even a month ago. And it's worth commending the United States uh, for taking the lead on mobilizing international support and helping us with the supply of artillery, for example, and other weapons. And this Rammstein format set, by, uh, set up by uh, Secretary of Defense, it's working. So big thanks to the Biden administration, to Secretary Austin, Secretary Blinken for making it all happen. But there is never a moment in the war when you can say, OK, we did our best. This is it. As long as the war continues, it means that more needs to be done. So now we are facing a, a big issue with multiple, <clears throat> with the lack, critical lack of multiple launch rocket systems. Uh, Russia has plenty of them, and they cover squares of our territory with fire, killing and destroying uh, everything. So we need these weapons as soon as possible. We are desperately waiting for them to arrive. Uh, on the financial front, uh, our 
economy is suffering more from uh, the Russian uh, destruction and Russian attacks than the Russian economy suffers from sanctions. Yeah. I'm not trying to say the sanctions are useless, but as long as Russia makes money on selling oil and gas, their pockets are pretty full. So we also need macro-financial assistance to help the country running, to keep the country afloat. And uh, the, third, the third element is actually, again, sanctions. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Russia feels pretty comfortable with current oil and gas prices. And uh, we have to seriously reconsider the sanctions policy. Do you they, believe you're making any progress on that in terms of your European counterparts? Hungary obviously being the major holdout when it comes to sanctioning Russian oil for now. There, is, there, there, are, uh, you know, there are two ways to approach sanctions. The first one is to say, okay, we will focus on oil and uh, seek ways how to uh, stop the purchase of uh, Russian oil. There is another way. You can do a more in-depth analysis and come to a conclusion, for example, that the vast majority of Russian oil sold uh, to the global market is carried by, by maritime uh, means, so by vessels. So if you sanctions, uh, if you tell shipping industry that everyone carrying Russian oil anywhere in the world will face problems, that will mean a big, uh, a big issue for... So you for believe they should Putin. sanction the shipping industry. My, my message my, now, my mess, I was very constructive and engaging and always uh, trying to understand concerns of partners when it came to sanctions. But now, after three months of fighting, my message is very simple. Kill Russian exports. As, except some critical, uh, critical items that the West needs. But we need a broad strategy aimed not at uh, blocking this or this. But the, the goal, the, the strategic purpose should be kill Russian exports. Stop buying from Russia. Stop allowing them to make money, which they then invest in the war machine that destroys, kills, rapes, and tortures people in Ukraine. Let's talk about the money a bit, because we are here at the World Economic Forum. Just a few days ago, President Zelensky essentially saying that we needed um, as much as $500 billion to rebuild Ukraine. That was, in some estimates, a conservative estimate, frankly. Um, but when you talk about that kind of money, you know, a year ago, when we would talk about Ukraine, we'd talk about it as one of the most corrupt countries in the world, a country run by oligarchs. Today, though, everybody's a hero. But folks here at the Forum, who understand money, we think, have real concerns about that kind of cash going to Ukraine, how it's going to be used, how it will be deployed, and whether or not it's going to just end up in the pockets of an oligarch. How do you respond to that? Maybe guys here at the Forum were as wrong on corruption as on their estimate that Ukraine will not survive three days because the Ukrainian army is corrupt, everything is corrupt, and they will fail. I think the best evidence of the fact that the issue of corruption in Ukraine is exaggerated is actually the fact that we are still fighting. If we had an incapable state run by oligarchs and uh, uh, corrupt bottom-up, uh, we would not have sustained the pressure. We would not have been sitting here and talking. I think we are in the moment when we all can allow ourselves to be honest with each other. And if people are saying, wow, we underestimated you on your capacity to defend yourself, perhaps the same people have to reconsider their stance on the scale and the threat of corruption in Ukraine. Uh, back to be back on track that everyone likes when Ukraine is covering its head with ashes, recognizes all of its disadvantages and everyone else is sitting and appreciating this act of self-humiliation, I can say that, of course, we are uh, open to building uh, all necessary mechanisms that will ensure transparency and efficiency of the use of costs that will be allocated for the reconstruction of Ukraine. What we want to avoid in particular is also that some of this money will be lost on the way to Ukraine because of the numerous intermediaries involved in the, uh, in the, financial, in the financial model. And this is why you know, for example, take the European Union. They are providing us with macro-financial assistance. $1.2 billion. Go straight to the budget. Right? Would they be doing it if they had no trust in us? No. This is a big amount of money for us, $1.2 billion. True, but you already have the Germans, for example, pushing back on the idea of taking on debt to rebuild Ukraine. I mean, they the basically... 
the Germans. They're right. essentially saying we can't ask our taxpayers at a time when oil prices, gas prices through the roof to take on debt for rebuilding Ukraine. So you've already have difficulties there in terms of how much money you think you're going to end up getting from the I, I totally themselves. agree with you. And I don't think that uh, American, German, or any other taxpayer in the world has to pay for what Russia has did. Uh, there is a way, there, there is an alternative way to, uh, to, to recover Ukraine. It's to make Russia pay for it. And we're talking about the seizure of assets. Absolutely. Seizure, seizure and transfer. And this is why the European Commission has recently come up with certain initiatives on how to create the legal framework for that. Canada passed a piece of law that uh, allows not only the seizure of assets, but also the transfer of those assets to the, per to the recovery or to the project uh, associated with uh, recovery of Ukraine. Make Russia pay for it. I mean, we, why everyone is trying to be merciful in Russia? Why, why some countries are, or some leaders or some politicians are concerned that we, we should not uh, go too far in putting pressure on Russia? Putin betrayed even those who tried to help him by launching a, a large-scale, full, open aggression against a sovereign country. The aggression that will go into textbooks as the most apparent example of an aggression of one country against another. Make Russia pay for it. There is a counter-narrative, which is that President Biden, of course, has called President Putin a war criminal. There are those in this room and there are those attending this forum in countries in the Middle East, India, the broader world beyond the West, who would say, actually, it's President Zelensky that's the criminal for continuing a war that is killing his own people and costing the world a heck of a lot of money. Because now we're not just talking about inflation, stagflation, the possibility of recession. We're also talking about an energy crisis, as you know, that's been ongoing for a long time, and famine. How do you respond to that? One has to be a political pervert to put blame on Ukraine for continued fighting against the country that attacked it, against uh, uh, the army that committed unspeakable atrocities in Ukraine, and against uh, the country that basically challenged the entire rule-based uh, order. What we're having now is the permanent member of the United, of the, of the United Nations Security Council who possess uh, who possesses the nuclear weapons, attacked another founding member of the United Nations, a sovereign country, for no good reason, and uh, is uh, trying to destroy it, denying the right of this country to exist. Now, today we, we saw the statement <clears throat> by the Russian official from the Russian, uh, I think, deputy foreign minister, who said, for example, Russia will unblock Ukrainian ports to allow exports of Ukrainian agricultural products to the global market if sanctions are imposed against Russia are lifted. So this is a clear blackmail. You could not find a better example of, of a blackmail uh, in international relations. If anyone is buying it, I think there is a problem with that person. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't waste too much of time trying to, to, change, to, to understand why that person is making that point. I understand what you say, but does the whole world have to pay for the fact that Ukraine refuses to give up territory to Vladimir Putin by famine, by higher energy costs? I think that uh, uh, we live in a world where everyone can make uh, its own choice on what to do and what not to do. Some believed... In the beginning of this war, some countries believe that this will never affect us. This is just Russia uh, and Ukraine. This is their affair. Now, this some of these countries are already feeling the pressure of the food crisis. And they feel the repercussions of this war on them. And this is only the beginning. And if we allow President Putin to continue his m military madness, uh, the crisis will go deeper and deeper. Because let, let me just explain one thing where we're heading to if Russia does not lift its blockade. So if we do not export our crops currently stored uh, in the territory of Ukraine, we will soon harvest another crop. We will bring it and put it next to the current storages, which are filled full. And while there will be a food crisis unfolding in some parts of the world, Ukrainian grain will be getting rotten under open skies. Now, if this problem is not resolved, Ukrainian farmers will not plant another crop. And, we will in, and the whole agricultural cycle in Ukraine will be interrupted. 
and that will mean a multi-year food crisis. Now, if, I, if anyone tries to say that it's Ukraine to blame for fighting for each other, it's the same thing as you see a criminal and a victim who is fighting for survival, and you blame the victim for uh, fighting too much. There's just been a report in the press that uh, Vladimir Putin has decided to lift the retirement age of the military, essentially say that he can keep more people in the military for longer. In terms of what's happening back at home, how would you assess the strength of Russia's military capabilities today? Because they're undoubtedly lethal. They, uh, they're extremely strong when it comes to ground uh, heavy weapons. Uh, artillery, military, uh, multi -launch, multiple launch rocket systems, uh, all kinds of radio jamming tanks, but not because they are more advanced than other similar weapons in the world, but because they have a certain quantity of them that they can throw on us one wave after another. Uh, their morale, uh, the morale of the Russian soldiers is very low. They don't understand what they're fighting for. Uh, but uh, if you take, if you imagine like a trench with Ukrainian soldiers who, keep, who hold the ground one attack after another, but on the other side there are commanders who send more and more soldiers and tanks and artillery and helicopters into the battle, you cannot win if you do not get sufficient amount of heavy weapons to oppose them. One day or sooner or later they will break the line. And this is, this is, this is the risk. And do you see President Putin, like Stalin before him, willing to use his own people as cannon fodder? This is the difference between us and them. We care for human life, and he doesn't. This is, I think, it's one of the conceptual differences between Ukrainians and, and Ukrainians and uh, Ukrainian and Russian systems. That uh, for him, human life is nothing. Whether be it Russian soldier or Ukrainian civilian, uh, not to mention Ukrainian soldiers, of course. And that's why in Donbas now, the, he, for example, we hold the position. Uh, our soldiers repel attack, kill thousands of Russian soldiers. There is another wave coming. They kill them, and instead of changing the and tactics, on on. Rush, instead of changing the tactics, Russian commanders order more and more of their soldiers right. to go into the battle. What about the loss, eventually, of public support when Ukraine is not necessarily on front page news anymore? It's not leading the news in the evenings or in the daytimes. It's not on Instagram, it's not on Twitter. You've been very, very active on social media. And that's all, no doubt helped your cause. But when you think about what happens next, look at Syria. Um, I understand that we all live in a big TV show and the situation to a large extent depends on what people see on, on television and uh, on their social media. Uh, the difference between uh, such people who are, it's hard to blame them, and us is that they can afford getting bored, and we can't. So even if the entire world changes, refocuses its attention to another catastrophe or another war or something, we will have to continue fighting, whatever it costs, whatever it, uh, uh, the cost will be, because this is the war for our existence as a nation, for our identity. And that's why, you know, there is no gray zone in this war. It's either black or white. Uh, it's, it's black on, or white, and we are the white ones. Donor fatigue, are you already experiencing that to a sense when you speak to European <clears throat> counterparts in the US? Uh, not really, not really. Uh, I, don't, I don't see the fatigue, but uh, some decisions take too much time uh, to make. And we are talking about Brussels, I imagine. <laughs> uh, the, and the price for every delayed decision, be it Brussels, uh, Berlin, Washington, or any other capital, is uh, the loss of life and loss of territory. So what seems to be just a decision-making process for some is real blood, tears, and sufferings for us. It's, it's, I must tell you that we saw since, since 24th of February, we saw some uh, revolutionary decisions made in Washington. Uh, and I remember calling Secretary Blinken one day and he said, Dmitro, half of my day is, signing, is about signing different papers related to supplying weapons to you. And I will always remember what he did and what he keeps doing. I really appreciate that. 
but uh, some, some countries were uh, dragging their feet uh, on the issue of supplying us with uh, all the necessary weapons that we simply lost. We're talking lost, about Germany? We simply lost time and, uh, and, uh, and some small pieces of our territory. Allow me to be a diplomat, to remain a diplomat, at least here. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I can make you, I can tell you honestly that uh, often, quite often, we heard that, uh, you know, uh, countries are reluctant to give us certain weapons because anyway it will take too long for Ukrainian soldiers to train how to use them and therefore there is, this is not an, something urgent. And uh, at a certain point I said to a foreign minister of one, of one country, and I keep saying it every time I hear this argument, that guys, it takes uh, much less time for Ukrainian soldier to get trained on your weapons than for you to make a decision to hand over that weapon to us. So, uh, but again, I don't want to complain. The situation now is much better compared to one month ago. Yeah. President Macron continues to have a dialogue with President Putin. Do you believe that's counterproductive? I believe it doesn't make. I mean, a can lot. somebody be negotiating for Ukraine without no, Ukraine? No, no, no one is negotiating for Ukraine without Ukraine. But I think that some, you know, the very the, the European political culture is based on the principle of dialogue. And uh, President Macron called President Putin many times uh, before the war, and we are still where we are. So he keeps calling him and talking with him. Fine, we we do not see that he's compromising us in his conversation with Putin. If he believes this, is, this helps, he can continue doing it. With, with his, he, he runs a sovereign nation and he believes, he does what he believes is the best. But we don't see a lot of sense in it. What about NATO today? We're talking now about Finland and about Sweden becoming a part of NATO. And President Putin again and again warned that if they were to take that decision, there would be problems, there would be repercussions. Now, Turkey's a holdout at this point, but I'm told that that's only a matter of time before they decide that Finland and Sweden can be a part of NATO. What's your take on that? Because when we first met at the end of last year, we talked about Ukraine's ambitions for NATO and for Europe. And you said if we were a part of NATO right now, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Thank you for uh, memorizing my words. Uh, <laughs> that's really nice of you. And yes, I can say it again. Uh, I believe that uh, Sweden and Finland understand now, understand Ukraine much better, even better than they did, because they feel now, they know now how it feels when you're trying to get into, to join the club, and a member of that club is like saying, ah, I have questions, I have issues about that. Uh, but seriously, uh, I don't think Putin has any serious leverage to prevent uh, Finland or Sweden from becoming members of NATO. And that once again proves that the whole discourse about Ukraine not being ready to get Ukraine on board or uh, NATO uh, not being ready uh, is not based on, uh, on specific merits. It's based on the political understanding of who belongs with us and who doesn't. NATO is about to absorb a country that has uh, like what around about one well, many hundreds of kilometers of joint border with Russia right next to St. Petersburg and no one is taking care of all the arguments that Putin is making about the speed of the missile and the vicinity of the NATO military base to the capital to the capital of Russia when it comes to Ukraine the moment you raise the issue you immediately hear hundreds of arguments why this is impossible hundreds yes People were saying, our army is not ready. <clears throat> Look at our army. It's the strongest, it's now the strongest army in Europe. I mean, among the, uh, among the European nations, we do not compete with the Americans uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, NATO standards, we are fighting a war against someone who is much bigger than us. And uh, knock on the wood, we are more successful than anyone expected. So all these technical discussions about standards, criteria, you know, once there is a political decision that these guys belong to us, we are part of the same, everything else follows. Yeah. As long as there is no such political decision, you are hearing hundreds of arguments why this is impossible. 
We understand how this business works, but uh, I believe that many uh, in NATO lost moral and professional ground to make any comments with regard to Ukraine. Do you believe that you will ever be part of NATO? Uh, now I'm focused on something completely different. Uh, you know, we are now focused on winning the war. And, um, you know, my, my people criticize me for saying that uh, uh, NATO did nothing uh, since the beginning of the war. And my experts, my NATO experts, they, they say I have to be more constructive. But I am constructive. My point is very simple. We see allies helping Ukraine out. We see this group of allies, NATO allies, helping us. But in the beginning of the war, the people of Ukraine, it was a public sentiment. They believed that NATO is the strong force and EU is only capable of expressing different various levels of concern, and that's it. But the war is always a test that rips masks off. And we all saw real faces. What we saw are some revolutionary, groundbreaking decisions taken by the European Union, which even they themselves did not expect to, to make. And we see NATO as an alliance, as an institution, sidelined and doing literally nothing. I'm sorry to say it. I do not complain on allies. Do you yes. see them as irrelevant? No, I think, it's, I think it's actually the decision of the allies themselves. Not, to remain. Not to, to do it, not, not to allow uh, NATO as an institution to act under these circumstances because for their, for their concerns, which they have, like NATO, Russia at war, all this stuff. But again, when it comes to accommodating Finland and Sweden, no one is making the point that uh, this increases the risk of NATO and Russia coming at war with each other. So there is a little, an element of hypocrisy in this. I understand that this is life. Uh, uh, we as a country, you know, we spent 30 years fighting prejudices and stereotypes uh, in attitudes towards Ukraine. So I can live with it. Don't get me wrong, I, I think NATO is important. Uh, the Europe integration of Ukraine to NATO is part of our constitution. Jens Stoltenberg, as Secretary General, is a, is a man who really does his best. But we see that these circumstances are not the good ones for, for NATO to show its best. And therefore, we can speak openly about the status quo. I want to ask you about oil and the OPEC Plus group. Do you believe that they have made the right decision to continue to include Russia as part of that alliance? In the first two months of the war, I became an expert in uh, weapons. And I spent the last months of the war becoming an expert in oil and global oil market. So, so you can rival me. Excellent. Uh, no, no. I think, <laughs> I think you're still far ahead of me, but at least I know that if I get fired, I will find myself a job. <laughs> uh, either selling weapons or, or uh, doing uh, oil, helping with oil business. Uh, I think it's complicated. I think the oil thing is more complicated than people, than people think. Uh, and uh, the issue now, in my view, is not in the amount of uh, oil available on the market, but in the logistical capacity of the global market to, uh, to restructure itself uh, to the new reality uh, we are facing. And uh, I still have, uh, I'm still uh, trying to understand this market in all details, which will help me to come to a judgment on the position of one country or OPEC plus as, as, an, as an organization. So your message to them? Uh, my message to them is very simple. Uh, if you're making, first, if you're making extra profits because of the high prices, this is the only reason for that is because Ukraine is suffering. Because it's the war, the Russian aggression that brought this, that changed the dynamics. But to be honest, we were in an energy crisis long before the war. Second, second, whatever, uh, you second work with Europe to help them overcome uh, current difficulties with oil and then gas. Because I think Europe, one of the lessons that Europe learned uh, since 24th of February is that Russia uses oil and gas as a weapon. For many decades, Russia's strategy was to, to convince everyone in Europe that they are reliable suppliers. This is not the case anymore, and I think that the Europeans realize that, that they cannot trust Russia and they want to diversify. So it's really important to help 
for other countries who belong to OPEC, except Russia, of course, to help Europe restructure its energy balance and solve at least some of the issues that are solvable. Um, that's what I would want them to focus. The, this, this situation now is ridiculous because what is happening is the following. Uh, Europe is allocating huge amount of money to help Ukraine. On a parallel track, they pay even more to Russia for gas and oil. Russia is investing this money into its war machine. This war machine uh, this, uh, inflicts more damage on Ukraine, and the Europeans are allocating even more money to mitigate uh, the consequences of uh, this war. So it's a vicious circle that has to be broken. Is there a point when you believe that Ukraine will start exporting its own energy? And I'm talking about electricity, because I understand that that's tied up in the parliament at this point. Yes, this, no, uh, th this is one of the good things happening. There are very few uh, good things happening in Ukrainian economy, <laughs> I have to be frank with you. But one of the good things is that uh, European Union accepted us as part of the joint uh, electricity grid. And so we, and we are heading, I think we are kind of one month away from actually becoming a participant on the market. And uh, next, no, two, in two weeks we will be, for example, in two weeks we will, I will be seeing foreign ministers of some European countries with whom we will be discussing the uh, export of Ukrainian electricity to the EU market. Because we make EU electricity grid more sustainable and uh, this is something that really makes it's a win-win situation for both Ukraine and the European Union. And then when it comes to exports, I don't think we will ever become exporters of gas, uh, not to mention oil, because we produce gas but not oil in sufficient quantities. But uh, I think we should seriously look into renewables, especially in green hydrogen. The European Union sees us as the uh, production facility for green hydrogen. And this is something that we will definitely be able to export once all necessary infrastructure is put in place. Your Excellency, before I let you go, at the conclusion of most of our interviews, and I think we've spoken about four times prior to the invasion and since then, I often will ask you, do you believe that this is a war that you can win? And you've consistently told me, not only will we win, but we must win. What's your assessment today of how long President Putin can keep this up? Because wars are expensive, his military not doing that well, although, as you say, he continues to just throw people into, into the cannon's mouth. But there are economic and social and, frankly, even bigger than that, world consequences to what he's doing. This war is a war of sustainability. Putin believes that we will collapse before he does. I mean, we as a country. So uh, we cannot allow uh, thinking about timelines. No, this is definitely, uh, again, not the case because, as I said, uh, this is the war for our existence and for our identity. It's not just an economic conflict over a piece of land or a source of uh, revenue. This is a war for identity. This is the war between Russia as a state and the people of Ukraine. And uh, I think it's impossible to win a war against the people. No end in sight? Uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings is that if you see the light in the end of the tunnel, make sure it's not a light from an incoming train. So there is always something uh, in the sight, but uh, I'm not sure whether it's the end or the incoming train. Your Excellency, thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you.